Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to talk about the rigid selectivity of the Diels-Alder reaction. If you haven't seen my videos on the introduction to the Diels-Alder reaction and the cis-trans uh, conformation of the dienes yet, watch those videos first and then come back to this one. All the links are in the description below as usual. So without any further ado, let's dive in. Ok, let's look at the following example over here. In this case, the molecules can react with each other in two different combinations, giving us two different constitutional isomers as our products. Let's say the combination A over here going to give us product A, and likewise the combination B going to give me the product B. Now, the question is, are both of these products will form in equal amounts or one of them is going to be the major product. And this is where two common traps are waiting for you. Trap number one is that many students forget that molecules don't care how we draw them and thus they fall into a trap of drawing the uh, products based on how the starting materials are presented to them. I am willing to bet that if I drew this reaction on the test and I drew, let's say, the combination A, the majority of students would give me the product A. And likewise, if I took this reaction and drew the combination B, the majority of students would give me the product B on the exam, while the reality is the molecules don't care how I draw them. The only difference here is that my Dana file, the species on the right, this guy is flipped upside down in the combination B, so does it really mean that it's going to give me a different product? Experienced instructors know this flow in students' logic and will try to catch you on the test with that. Another trap is that students overemphasize the steric hindrances and the importance of product stability. Of course, sterics is important, and the thermodynamic stability of your product is important as well, but you need to recognize when it is a determining factor and when it is not. The thermodynamic stability of your product is only relevant when the reaction is an equilibrium and when the reaction is allowed to to reach said equilibrium. So if you are not thinking about this reaction and just looking at the possible steric hindrances, then yeah, a lot of students would say that, well, I have one bulky group and I have the other bulky group, so those two groups should be as far from each other as possible. So therefore, the second product, the product B, should be my final product. And as I've mentioned, that would have been correct if sterics was the only consideration that we have in this case. But that is not the only consideration. And the first thing that I want to discuss here is that is deals all the reaction and equilibrium to begin with? Well, it surely is, but it is a very slow equilibrium. At normal conditions, we'll never reach this equilibrium. Thus, the Diels-Alder reaction is what we would normally refer to as a kinetically controlled reaction. In other words, it means that whatever product forms the fastest, that will be our final or major products. So how do we know which product forms faster and why? The trick here is in the molecular polarization due to the resonance. Well, let's look at our diene first. Here I have an oxygen with electron pairs and that oxygen can donate electron pairs into the conjugated system and because of that cause the resonance polarization. So if I were to draw my resonance structures, I would first start by pushing my electrons towards the pi bond, which moves the pi bond towards one of the carbons, which is going to give me a resonance structure looking like this. This is not the only other resonance structure that is possible, I can also take the electron pairs from this carbon and move those towards the next double bond like this, giving me one more resonance structure looking like that. Now, the two resonance structures that I just drew here, they are the minor contributors. However, they are still important enough to cause the differences in the electron density throughout the molecule and have our molecule molecule have delta pluses and delta minuses, aka the parts of the molecule with the excess of the electron density and the lack of the electron density. And so if I were to draw my resonance hybrid where I can superimpose my contributors, I'm going to get something like this. The important part here is that if I were to number my atoms, 1, 2, 3, and 4, the atoms 1 and 4 are going to be the ones that are going to be making a new bond uh, via the deals of the reaction, and the atom number 4 in this case, this guy, 
has a partial negative charge. It will become important once we draw the resonance structures for our Dana file and see how the distribution of electron density plays out in that molecule. So now, if I take my Dana file and I do the same resonance structure analysis for that one, in this case, oxygen is going to be a part of the CO double bond, part of the carbonyl, and that one is going to be an electron withdrawing group, which means that our electron density is going to migrate towards that like this, giving me the following minor contributor for my resonance structure. And like in the previous case, now I can draw my resonance hybrid, and if I number my atoms the same way I've been doing that for my deals all the reactions before, giving them numbers 5 and 6, now I can see that in this case, carbon number 5 has a delta plus charge. So now, if I am trying to react my two molecules together, I can see that in the first case, when they are reacting the way they are supposed to, by making bonds between 1 and 6 and 4 and 5, we can see that the polarity of the molecules matches the ends of the molecules appropriately, so they have no troubles clicking onto each other, so to speak, because these ends match fine. However, if I were to do it the other way around, and try to react 1 and 5 and 4 and 6. Now, in this case, I see that my polarity does not match and instead molecule would be attracted to each other incorrectly. So, going back to my original picture, I can now say that the product A is going to be the actual product that we are going to be seeing in this reaction as our major product and product B is only going to be seen as a very minor product. So, remember, if your diene and your diene file are not symmetrical, first check the polarization of the molecules via the resonance and only then bring your molecules together for the reaction. Now, checking the resonance structures every single time can be a little bit tedious and if you are pressed for time, there is a bit of a trick that will work in most cases. When it comes to your dienes, you are most commonly going to be seeing dienes with electron donating groups or EDG for short. For unsymmetrical dienes, there are two possible places where your electron donating group can be. It can be either sitting at the edge of the molecule, so that's going to be your carbon either number 1 or number 4, depending on how you number it, or it is going to be sitting either on carbon number 2 or carbon number 3, again, depending on how you're going to number it. When you're reacting your diene with your diene file, diene file in most cases is going to have electron withdrawing groups or EWG. Now, obviously, your electron withdrawing group can be either on carbon number 5 or it can be on number 6, again, depending on how you number your molecules. But here is a trick. When you do the deals all the reaction, your electron donating group and your electron withdrawing group are always going to be either adjacent to each other on the nearby atoms like that, or they're going to be across the molecule on the opposite ends of the molecule, but they're never going to be at like one three position to each other. So you're never going to see something like this or something like that. Of course, if you have more groups on your Dane and Dana file, this is not going to look as nice and as clean, but that's the general idea how you can quickly predict your products without going through the resonance every single time, although we still want you to go through the resonance and you still should know how to do that because if you have a complex case, the resonance is always going to be your final deciding factor that you are going to be looking at and no trick is ever going to save you on the exam if you don't know how to do it without tricks. Now, let's look how all of this looks in practice. For my first example, I have this diene over here with the OCH3 group that's going to cause the uh, change in the polarity in my molecule and I also have diene 5 with a triple bond and the carbonyl that's also going to cause the change in the polarity of the molecule as well. So, step number one is going to be to look at the resonance structures for both of those molecules and see where we are going to have our delta plus and delta minus. For the first one, my diene, I'm going to have the electrons on the oxygen go towards the double bond 
and move the electron density onto a carbon, which means that I'm going to end up with a delta minus on that carbon over here. When it comes to my Dana file, I have a carbonyl, so carbonyl is going to be pulling electron density towards itself, meaning that we are going to be pulling electron density out of the triple bond, giving us delta plus over here. Next, step number two is going to be to redraw my molecules in a more convenient shape so we can easily see how the reaction is going to happen. I will draw my diene like that and I will remember that delta minus was on this carbon and I will redraw my Dana file again remembering that delta plus was over here and I'm orienting my molecules in space in such a way as to easily react them with each other in the appropriate form so I'm going to have those bonds being formed, so if I number my atoms as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, I'm going to be making a bond between 1 and 6 and 4 and 5, so if I wanted to draw my curved arrows, it's going to be something of this sort, so they go around the circle or they can go the other way around if you like, as I've mentioned in my previous video, it really doesn't matter how you draw that part. So then, in order to predict my product, I am first going to draw a stem for the molecule, which is going to be a six-membered ring with double bonds between carbons 2 and 3 and 6 and 5, because our Diana file is a triple bond. And then I'm going to add my appropriate groups, so that's going to be OCH3 on carbon number 3 and my ester on carbon number 6 like that. And here, just like when I was talking about the trick, uh, the two groups that I have in this molecule ended up being across the molecule from each other. Now let's move this reaction to the side so I have a little bit more space to work on the next example. Talking of which, there you go. Now, in this case, we again have the diene on the left side and diene file on the right side. When it comes to my diene file, that one is going to be pretty straightforward. Carbonyl pulls the electron density towards itself, so the double bond is polarized towards that, which means that the carbon on the bottom, this one, is going to have our delta plus charge. Now, when it comes to our diene, though, the situation is a little bit more difficult because now we do not have any atoms with electron pairs that can easily push the electron density into our diene. So, how are we going to deal with something like that? Well, we are going to pretend that this carbon that I have on my isopropyl group is some sort of a hetero atom, some sort of X, if you like, with an electron pair. Yes, it is not a 100% correct way to approach the resonance, it's sort of like a trick, but it gives you exactly the same results. So if instead of my carbon I had some sort of X, and that X were to push the electron density into my diene like that, that means that I would end up with a delta minus on my very last carbon, which means that I have delta minus over there, so now I know the polarization of my molecule and I can proceed with the next step where I'm going to redraw my diene and diene file like so and now I can react them together making a bond between these two atoms and those two atoms. So if I number them it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So I am again making a bond between 1, 6 and 4 and 5. Drawing my curved arrows I can go here, 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 I purposefully did it in the opposite direction from how I did it in the last case, just to show you that it really doesn't matter how you choose your direction. And my final product here will end up looking like this, where I have my isopropyl group on carbon number one, my electron withdrawing group on uh, carbon number six. So in this case, my two group ended up being adjacent to each other and not across from each other. Now, I also do have a group on carbon number five, but since that group didn't really do anything for the resonance purposes, it is uh, not an electron withdrawing group on the inner file, I'm going to ignore that. So when you are analyzing your final structure and you're looking at the position of groups in your molecule, only pay attention to those groups which you have used in your resonance or to determine the polarization of your molecules to begin with. Everything else you can ignore for these purposes. Just don't forget to show them on the actual final product, because just because you ignore them didn't mean that they disappear. And for my last example, I have these two guys. Now, the Diana file in this case is actually the molecule on the right. Remember how molecules don't care how we draw them? Well, they also don't care in which order we draw them. And this is a very common trick that some instructors love to throw at students on the exams by switching things up a little bit. Make sure you identify 
identify what is a diene and diene file by looking at the nature of your molecule rather than where the molecule is drawn. Because if I switch things around, that doesn't change the nature of the molecule itself. Oxygen can pump electron density into our diene, which means that we are going to end up with a delta minus on the last carbon on the left side, like so. When it comes to my diene file, that one is actually exactly the same molecule as in the previous example, but just rotated in space, so here I'm going to have my electrons moving towards the oxygen, which means that we are going to end up with a delta plus on this carbon over here. Now, redrawing these two in a more appropriate orientation in space, I'm going to get this pair, so now I can show how I make the bonds between 1 and 6 and 5 and 4, and I will show my curved arrows like this again. And the final product here is going to look like this, where my electron donating group on carbon number one and my electron withdrawing group on carbon number six are again adjacent to each other. And like in the previous case, I am ignoring the positioning of the group number two and number five because those were not involved in the resonance, so I don't care how they ended up in my final molecule, they didn't drive this show, so to speak. So that is how you would approach your deals all the reactions when both start materials, the diene and diene file are non-symmetrical. The regioselectivity of the diels alder reaction is, of course, an important aspect of this chemistry, and you are likely going to see a question, or maybe even a few, about that on the test. So remember, it is all about the molecular polarization and has nothing to do with aesthetics in this case. If molecules are not attracted to each other to begin with, well, who cares what the aesthetics is going to be? If the molecules are not attracted to each other appropriately, they are just not going to be reacting with each other. Now, one other important aspect of the diels alder reaction is going to be the product stereochemistry. For the past couple of videos, I purposefully ignored the stereochemistry here because that is quite a can of worms. So, the stereochemistry of the diels alder reaction is typically following what is known as the Ander rule, and it will be the subject of my future video. So, thank you for watching this video till the very end. Make sure to hit the like button to help promote this video so more students can see it. Remember to subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates if you haven't done so yet. Watch this video next, and I will see you tomorrow!